today I'm joined by David Senstaba, co-founder of IOTA. Thanks for joining me, David. Thanks for having me, Arthur. So, David, could you please give us a bit of background about yourself apart from your relationship with IOTA? For sure. So my journey into the realm of distributed ledger slash blockchain technology slash internet of things can be traced back to my teens, essentially, when I got really interested in futurism and futurology, kind of like the study of future technology. And I remember I was part of these groups called the Everything List and Overcoming Bias, Less Wrong, Long City, which had these very stimulating discussions about artificial intelligence, the the future of automation and how it would impact society and so on and so forth. And this was also the area where Wei Dai and Hal Finney, etc. A lot of these legends kind of hung around. So I was exposed to this technology quite early on. But it wasn't until 2012 that I actually dug into the fundamentals of the technology and realized that, hey, this is not just transactions uh, for niche applications. This is actually something that can be applied to a lot more fascinating areas. So ever since then, I pretty much uh, started working full time in the blockchain realm. In 2013, I joined forces with a guy called Sergey Vancheglo. So Sergey Vancheglo, he invented the full proof of stake. So in fact, the algorithms that Ethereum is hoping to port <laughs> to later on, he was the guy behind that. At the time, he was a lead developer and founder of the NXT project. And that's when I also met Dominic Schiener, one of my other co-founders. He was working on creating this bridge between the fiat world and the blockchain world. Because as you recall back then, it was almost impossible to buy tokens compared to the situation is today. And that's also where we met uh, Sergey Popov, the math professor. So we are the four founders of the IOTA project. And Sergey Popov, author of the white paper, right? Yeah, he is the author of the white paper. He is a tremendous mathematician, or as I like to call him, a mathematician, because some of the formulas that these guys <laughs> on that level come up with is, is a bit hard to digest. Mathematician, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so who did you say was the founder and lead developer of Next? NXT, sorry? Uh, yeah, so, so that's Sergey Von Sheglo. He's better known by his moniker, Come From Beyond. Does he know who the guy BC Next was? Yeah, he, it was him. <laughs> was it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> it's legal to say that now. Like back then, I think only I knew it. But now, uh, yeah, it, it just sort of became this issue where it had to come out. The truth had to come out. Wow. This is a mystery. <laughs> like This is like a mystery being solved. I yeah. have no idea. And you do it so casually. You just lift yeah. the veil. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't like to hype things around IOTA. We, we tend to be very pragmatic and down to earth about what's actual rather than hyping things up. So we do it casually. It's interesting you use that term pragmatic because that's exactly how I described the uh, design of IOTA to a friend recently. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, and that's, that's kind of the entire engineering philosophy and design philosophy behind IOTA is to create something that actually works for the real world. So, you know, a lot of these different distributed ledger projects like Bitcoin, Ethereum and so on, they often have origins in different ideological positions. And that's fine, but it sometimes affects, and in, at least in my opinion, negatively the engineering decisions. Whereas in IOTA, the founders and the community, all of us have different ideologies, different ideas, but we keep that shit separate from the actual protocol. We just want something that can actually scale and work in the real world. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I just had a thought. What was the guy's name? Sorry. BC Next guy? Sergey Ivan Sheglo. Does Sergey know who JL777 was? So actually, I think I know better who he is because... This goes way back. This was like early 2014. I remember having a lot of interaction with him. And so I would say I do have a very good idea of his identity, but I don't feel like it's appropriate for me to say anything about it because I think he wishes to remain anonymous. We don't tend to see eye to eye on a lot of things, but when it comes to his privacy, I will respect it regardless. For the audience, BC Next was the mysterious founder of NXT, and JL777 was this brilliant developer who developed a whole bunch of cool services to run on the NXT platform, one of which was SuperNet, 
which is all the rage these days. Although it may be, I'm not really fully sure the story of Supernet, and we're also really straying from <laughs> a discussion of IOTA. I know. Yeah, no problem. Nah, so, you know, when it comes to Supernet, I always stayed away from it simply because it didn't adhere to my pragmatic principles. Like, I, I completely agree that JL777 is a tremendous developer. He is definitely very brilliant uh, in that aspect. But when it comes to like real life applications and so on and so forth, I just didn't see it. So I stayed the fuck away from it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seemed like a nice idea. Well, yeah, especially when you go back to 2014, when all of this was just experimentation. Like it, it was way before all of this was like a hundred billion dollar uh, market. So at the time, I guess people just found it interesting and they put their funds into it and they've definitely created some interesting technology but my main concern is again that it's not focused on the real world enough for me to get involved so bringing this into the real world can you give us an idea about what iota is and how its design decisions reflect real world use cases oh yeah for sure. So if we go back to 2014 again, we started getting, and when I say we, I mean, of course, me, Dominic, uh, Sergey, and Sergway. We started getting heavily into the Internet of Things and focusing on distributed computing and these actual use cases. And of course, due to our blockchain expertise and background, it was very natural to try to marry those two technologies and see, for instance, how can we incentivize distributed computing? How can we incentivize sharing of uh, data or other technological resources. But the problem became very obvious to us in the fact that blockchain simply doesn't scale. And it also has a lot of problems with high fees, which makes a lot of these use cases that we have in mind prohibitive. Let me just give you one simple example. If you are a sensor gathering data and you want to sell this data to a computational station somewhere else, then if you want to do this in real time, fine granular fashion, most likely these data packets will only be worth like 0.01 cent or something like that. And if you were to use like Bitcoin or Ethereum for that, you would have to pay like $100,000 fee to get that transaction confirmed. And that makes absolutely no business sense whatsoever. So those use cases have been prohibited from actually existing. And so we started thinking, okay, the blockchain clearly doesn't work, so we have to come up with a new architecture that retains the principles, i.e. decentralization, immutability, and those kinds of principles, but at the same time actually works. So this led to the idea of using a directed icyclic graph rather than this sequential chain of blocks. Just think of it like a graph where it's actually growing. So just like kind of like a tree branching, I think everyone has seen a graph before. That is a two-dimensional realm rather than, than this one dimension of a blockchain. So we got rid of the blocks entirely. We got rid of the rigid chain entirely. And then applied this directed icyclic graph in a manner that we call Tangle. And the reason we call it a Tangle is that the transactions are literally tangled with each other. And if you look at it from a... You probably saw that in the white paper. Like If you look at it, it looks like a Tangle. Because it literally is tangled together. So essentially a directed acyclic graph is a set of relationships that are unidirectional, meaning that you start from one transaction and that transaction is connected to by subsequent transactions, which are connected to by subsequent transactions. But the connection never circles around. The relationship is always one way, meaning the original never references anything new. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So a graph, you have the nodes and then you connect the nodes, like you just said, in the manner that you just said. When you use this directed icyclic graph architecture, at least the implementation that we have in IOTA, you get rid of this problem in the blockchain. So in order to explain this, let me step one step back and contrast it to blockchain. So in blockchain, you essentially have decoupled validation of the network from usage of the network, which gives rise to two parties. You have the users and then you have the validators. And their incentives are diametrically opposed in a sense, because me as a user in blockchain, the only thing I care about is that my transaction gets confirmed as fast as possible. Whereas as a validator, the only thing I care about is making the most money. That's why I'm in this game. That's my role as a validator. I want to get the block rewards and I want to collect the fees. 
And due to the blockchain being constructed in such a way that you have a limited quantity of transactions that you can put into each block and a limited amount of blocks that you can validate, you end up with this traditional law of supply and demand kind of economic model where I, as a validator, I will only include a transaction that has the highest fee because that's how I get the best profit margins. This is what we're seeing all the time. Whenever there is high volume on the blockchain, the fees skyrocket and the networks get very congested. IOTA, in contrast, you as a user, you're also the validator. So there is no miners, there is no separate validators. So when you issue a transaction, you validate two previous transactions in the graph. And this means that there is no other party to compensate. So there is no fee involved in this transaction whatsoever. And that in itself is very beautiful because now validation has become an intrinsic property of utilizing the network. So the value has been transferred over to utility. And of course, that is, in my opinion, the best kind of value when you have actual utility. And the other issue that this resolves directly is centralization. So in blockchain, you have a lot of centralization. So even though it's heralded kind of as the epitome of decentralization, blockchain tends to centralize around resources. That's why we have mining pools, staking pools, and so on and so forth, because that makes economic sense. It's just the incentives that are inherent to blockchain architecture. In IOTA, there is no such incentive. So there is no centralization around resources. Instead, the entire network is just comprised of these endless amounts of validators and users that are kind of one-to-one relationship between them. So that gets rid of the fees, that gets rid of the centralization. And then we come to the third point, which is, especially today, a very, very hot topic, which is the scalability. Because due to the big ICOs that is occurring right now on the Ethereum network, the network is fucking useless. Like, it doesn't work whatsoever. I mean, exchanges has to halt trading. People high up in the system of Ethereum, they they go out urging people not to use the network, etc., which is terrible when you think about it. So scalability is the hot topic right now. And the way that we resolve that issue is that because there is no finite limit to how many transactions that can occur per second in a network, instead what happens is that as you issue a transaction, you validate two previous transactions, meaning that the more usage occurring on the network, the more validation occurs on the network. And since there is no block, since there is no limit, instead there is this graph, it can grow infinitely. Like there is no inherent limit to how much validation can occur per second in IOTA. It's all dependent on the usage of IOTA. Of course, excluding bandwidth, like at the end of the day, the laws of physics kicks in and you have to abide by (laughs) the laws of physics. But beyond that, there is no limit to how much it can scale. But there are some limitations to the security of the network. Mm, depends. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation or misunderstanding around consensus in IOTA, but, but, but I would love to hear if you have some specific concern. Well, to me, it seems like we haven't actually talked about the weighting of the transactions and how one prevents double spending or state alterations. Yeah, 